Chapter three focuses on the interview and less on the questions and more on the techniques of performing a therapeutic interview. So this is really about communication and about establishing therapeutic relationships. In order to get the most out of this chapter from your book, first reflect. What communication strengths do you have? What is it that you want to improve upon? Do you feel shy when you first enter a room? Do you have a difficult time organizing your thoughts? Are you uncomfortable with silence? Do you feel sometimes that you say things that you wish you had not said afterwards? Make a list of the things that you want to learn from this chapter about personal communication during the patient interview. Then read this chapter with intention. Make notes that are relevant to you. Think about what are the phases of the interview process and why is it important that we're clear about our purpose, even for short interactions with the patient? How do you adjust your communication techniques for various patients? Verbal, written, teaching, and how do you validate understanding in patients of different ages, cultural, and cognitive abilities? So let's start by examining the difference between subjective and objective data. Subjective is what the person says about themselves or what caregivers report. This is data that's collected from the viewpoint of the subject. This would be things like pain, thirst, hunger, feeling hot, feeling cold, nausea, fatigue, joint or muscle pain, weakness, agitation, anxiety, things that you as the examiner would not be able to put a label on or recognize without the viewpoint of the subject. Objective data is data that you as the examiner can obtain through the steps of the assessment, inspection, palpation, percussion, percussion and auscultation. The patient does not necessarily have to provide input in order for you to know that it is there. This would be things like increased work of breathing, diaphoresis, vital signs, lab work, EKGs, lung sounds, heart sounds, bowel sounds, skin turgor, edema, wound assessment, things that I can assess that the patient does not necessarily have to participate in other than to just be present for the assessment. The purpose of the interview is to gather the health assessment data. So you're trying to collect specific information about the health status of that individual. It needs to be purposeful and time limited. You should validate information regarding health and illness, and it should be holistic, focusing on the total patient and not just a chief complaint. In medicine, you might hear us talk about data sets. This is information that we use for different things such as research, epidemiology, and data collection. When you're doing a health assessment, the data set, the minimum amount of information you should include is the present and past states of health, the family status and relationship, cultural background, any lifestyle preferences, developmental and educational level, social support, religion, and sexuality and reproductive process. All right, communication. Communication is a critical concept and something that we'll talk more about in our uh, NUR 2010. Uh, but basically this is um, the, all of the factors that come into play, your verbal, your nonverbal, that are sending messages to the, the person that you're talking to. 
So first of all, you have to decide what you want to say, and then you create the message in a way that you think the person's going to understand it, and then you deliver the message, and then they receive it, but then they have to interpret it. And then hopefully they give you some sort of response to indicate whether or not they interpreted it correctly. All behavior has meaning. So no matter what you do, whether it's a gesture, whether it's a facial expression, whether it's silence, whether it's, you know, a word, all of that communicates something. Your goal when you're establishing a therapeutic relationship is to communicate caring and empathy, you know, to have an open kind of persona and um, to be professional, but kind at the same time. Think about internal and external factors regarding communication. Internal factors include looking at yourself and thinking, do you like other people? You should be friendly toward your client. It doesn't cost you anything to be friendly. You should, again, convey empathy. You should listen, and you should be self-aware about your own personal biases and beliefs, and then work hard to overcome those during your interaction. Externally, look at, think about the patient. So you wanna ensure safety and security and privacy, comfort. Refuse interruptions. That time that you're spending with the patient is for that patient alone, unless it's obviously a, a, an emergency. Make the physical environment as comfortable as possible. And when dealing with an electronic health record, which can be very helpful to rapidly and you know, accurately convey information, make sure it doesn't become a barrier to communication. Don't allow it to stand between you and the client or the patient. Um, if you're going to type into the EHR while you're with the patient, make sure that you explain what you're doing. So talk to the patient, get the information, ask questions for clarification, pause and say, I just wanna put that in your chart really quickly before I forget it. Add it in and say, thank you. Now I wanna ask you a few more questions and move on. Your goal or your role as an RN is to facilitate a good interview. Even if the patient comes in and they're having the worst day imaginable, if you introduce yourself, you're open and you're friendly, you're kind, and you treat the patient with respect and compassion, you can turn that day around for them. They can leave there feeling good about the interaction that they had with you. Be sure to review the chart before the interview. There's nothing more frustrating to a patient than ignorance. If you're asking them about, you know, have you, do you have any pain in your left foot only to find out that they don't have a left foot, you know, they're an amputee, that's, it's insulting. Just take a minute, review the chart, make sure you know the basic information about that patient. Call them by their preferred name. Ask, don't assume. So when people come into the hospital now, we always say, do you identify as male, female, or other? And what are your preferred pronouns? And then you should use those. The same is true when you just introduce yourself to anyone, you should say, hi, my name's Inga. I'm the nurse taking care of you today. How do you like to be called? Or what would you like me to call you? And then call them that. Don't ask somebody, what would you like to be called? And then have them say, Miss Smith. And then instead of calling them Miss Smith, call them Jane. So make sure that you're calling them by their preferred name. And explain the plan. So there's a lot of anxiety for a patient who's either in the hospital, at the office, you know, in the emergency room, wherever you encounter them, you know, a lot of it re is in response to like time or they're exhausted or whatever. So explain the plan. You know, um, how are you doing? Do you need anything? I'm, I'm going to ask you a few questions about your medical history and then, you know, whatever. I'm going to start an IV, draw some blood, 
and and uh, see what I can do to make you more comfortable. So explain the, the plan so that they know what's happening so they don't feel like they're just having a rambling conversation with you without purpose. Throughout the interview, utilize those good communication techniques that you've learned, the active listening skills, the solar, so sit facing the patient, open posture, lean forward, make good eye contact, and be relaxed. Avoid barriers to communication, those are listed in your book. Ask open-ended questions for general information and closed-ended questions for details. Hi, my name is Inga. Can I ask you a couple of questions? You know, what brings you in today? That's an open-ended question. What brings you in today? It allows them to go in any direction. Oh, you have chest pain? Tell me more about that. On a scale of one to 10, how bad is it? Right? So that's a very closed-ended question because I'm asking for detail. I'm asking for a specific number. So you want to use both open-ended questions and closed-ended questions in your assessment. Maintain patient privacy and confidentiality. Make sure that the curtains and the doors are uh, pulled. Um, you know, if you are using a computer, make sure that the screen is not somewhere where other people can see it. And if you ever walk away from your computer, make sure that you sign out. And then no side conversations. So if someone comes to the door and says, I need to ask you a question about your patient next door, step out. Don't have the conversation about the patient next door in front of the patient in this door. Again, patients want to know that you're looking out for their best interests and you're protecting their privacy. They would rather that you took a second to protect their roommates or the guy over there's privacy than to violate, you know, somebody next door's privacy because then the assumption is that you're going to violate theirs as well. On page 33, you can review table 3-3. <clears throat> and this is the examiner's verbal, verbal responses. Um, so it talks about the client's perspective and the examiner's perspective. Just a good review of communication techniques. Avoid barriers to conversation, such as taking notes or um, taking phone calls on your cell phone or your uh, regular phone or pager during the interview. This appears like you're not paying attention to the patient and it makes them less engaged. Acknowledge your personal biases and preconceptions. We all have them, it's impossible not to. And acknowledge them honestly so that you can overcome them. Repetitive interviews on the same subject so if the doctor goes in and asks questions, the nurse goes in and asks the same questions, the nursing student, medical student, paramedic student, everybody's asking the same questions. It makes the um, patient feel like they're not being heard. Instead, go in and say, I know that you've been asked these questions before. I want to just go over some of the information to make sure that I understand um, your answers you know, correctly and um, see if there's anything else that you remembered. That helps them know that they've been heard and gives you the opportunity to ask additional questions and uh, delve into some of the topics a little bit deeper. Try not to impede on patient's personal space unless you're doing a physical exam. So during the interview, you want to remain at least arm's length, but ideally four to six feet away. And review the 10 traps of interviewing, which are basically uh, barriers to communication that are on page 32 through 35 in your book. So as an RN, you are going to think critically about the needs and the abilities of your patients and their families and their caregivers as you are caring for them. So you're going to adapt your interview to meet the cognitive and developmental needs of the patient. The acutely ill patient is not going to be able to have long drawn out conversations with you. Um, and so really when you have a patient who's acutely ill, you're going to focus on the immediate problem only until it's resolved and then you can go back and get more information. In a patient who has chronic illness, you're going to want to review the chart as much as possible. Listen to the patient, think about how it's impacting their life and, um, you know, not having to review their entire medical record every single time they come in contact with the medical system. For the hearing impaired, think about ways to communicate. Do they need an interpreter? Do they need a sign language interpreter? 
Um, make sure that they can hear and understand you appropriately. If they read lips, make sure that you speak just you know normally, clearly, and facing them so that they can see your mouth. For the visually impaired, make sure that you knock and introduce yourself every single time you walk into the room. So knock, knock. Hi, it's Inga. I'm your nurse. You know, versus knock, knock. Hi, it's, you know, Joe. I'm your whatever doctor. So, you know, every time you walk into a room, um, it's nice to knock and introduce yourself because you're entering that patient's kind of private space. But if you forget, make sure, especially with the visually impaired, that you're giving them some sort of auditory marker that you're present. For the patient who's cognitively impaired, this can become a challenge emotionally and also um, from a safety standpoint. So patients who are under the influence of drugs or alcohol can become emotionally labile and they can be happy, they can be sad, they can be angry, they can be all of those things all at once. They can rapidly vacillate in between them. Um, so just be very careful. Uh, some patients will be sexually inappropriate. Again, just be careful. It is completely within your rights and you should always set limits. And so, you know, as long as the patient is safe and there's no threats to ABCs, it's okay to say, you know what, it's not all right for you to talk to me that way. I'm going to go take care of another patient. I will be back in a few minutes and we can continue this conversation, but I'm not going to sit here and let you talk to me like that. And you can walk away. Call the police, call security, call whoever, document in the chart in quotations what the patient was saying to you or what they were doing in terms of gestures or whatever, and that you, you know, reoriented them to what was appropriate and inappropriate, and that you gave them a break to, you know, decompress or calm down, and that you tried to reapproach them and in how many minutes. Don't make it a long period of time, definitely no more than 15 minutes, but just, you know, give them a break. A patient who's crying, um, remember that you're not responsible for their pain, but obviously we want to uh, make sure that patients are well taken care of. Uh, so try not to get too drawn into the drama that can occur sometimes in the workplace. Um, and a patient who is angry or violent. So your own mask first, as they say on the airplane, but you need to make sure that you're safe. So it's really important that um, at all times that you maintain situational awareness. If the patient is violent, you should never be alone with them. Never allow an angry patient or violent patient to get between you and the door. And um, always call for help or ask for more help if you feel like you're going to need it. Remember that you can't treat what you don't find. So it's really critical that we ask the right questions and we ask all of the questions. So ask those questions that feel sensitive. So when was the last time that you had your period? When was the last time that you had intercourse? Did you use protection? Have you had your period since then? Is there any chance that you could be pregnant? Have you had any, you know, new partners lately? Um, at, you know, asking the right questions is critical. Um, ask the questions that you feel uncomfortable asking because I can guarantee you the patient doesn't feel any more comfortable about you asking them than you do. Um, so just do it. Ask the right follow-up questions. So if you ask a patient if they have chest pain and they say yes, that can't be the last question that you ask. So then you have to do your OBQRSTU to find out more about it. And then there are questions that we consider what we call pertinent negatives. So you want to ask any, you know, shortness of breath, nausea, syncope, lightheadedness, dizziness, abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea, um, you know, things like that that would help you distinguish what the underlying cause was of the pain. All of this drives the appropriate plan of care. Um, so make sure that the plan of care that you're writing is based on complete factual evidence. Um, as they say, don't go chasing waterfalls.